My name is Michael Hepburn. I'm a senior deputy prosecuting attorney with King County. I work for Dan Satterberg, the prosecutor. He's right here. I want to welcome all of the dignitaries who will be um, acknowledged uh, as uh, the program continues. Uh, my designated job is to greet you all. Welcome to the 2020 MLK Junior County Celebration and to ask you, not yet, to stand and join me in singing the African American National Anthem. But before we do, I'd like to ask that you think of the theme of the song, lift every voice and sing in a different way. Lift every voice, the voices that are not as vocal, as loud, the voices that are less privileged, the voices that are disadvantaged, lift every voice. That's our job working for King County. Each of us, that's who we're supposed to be. And I'm gonna ask that you renew that pledge that you will do your best and strive to lift every voice as you stand, rise with me, please, and sing the African American National Anthem. Every voice. Our King County Native American Leadership Council. My name is Pamela Stearns. I'm Clinkett from Southeast Alaska. Tino Salute, Nespers. Catherine Festa. I'm a Hyder Raven from the Double Fin Killer Whale Clan. It's an honor to be sharing space with all of you as we celebrate the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King a man who fought against poverty and for equality, dignity, and civil rights. The Leadership Council, the Council's mission is to ensure that more indigenous voices are heard at all levels in King County, from the workers 
and drivers in the streets, in the courtrooms, and boardrooms. In order for that to happen, the county, its institutions and partners must recognize where you are. On the lands inhabited by the indigenous people for tens and thousands of years. Most of the lands we live on, sleep on, work on, were in fact taken away from the indigenous peoples without their consent. And most, if not all, of us enjoy privileges that directly stem from non-indigenous settling of those lands. And so, I'd like for all of us to acknowledge and show respect to the First Peoples, the indigenous peoples, our elders and our ancestors, past, present, and future, on whose land we stand. Today, we, deep, we offer deep gratitude to the Muckleshoot, the Snoqualmie, the Tulalip, the Duwamish tribes, and to the Salish people, whose land and waters support us. Let us commit to learning more about their histories and celebrate their culture and traditions that remain a vital part of our communities. Please join us in a brief moment of silence to give thanks and to reflect upon how we can develop better relationships with our indigenous neighbors. Hawa. Goodness, cheese. That's thank you and clean good. Katsiyaya. Thank you and Nespers. Thank you to our very own King County Native American Leadership Council. I am Erica Newman. And I'm, and I'm Matias Valenzuela. From the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration Planning Committee. On behalf of the committee and all of King County, we would like to welcome everyone to the annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration. Today, we are joined together under the theme in quotes from our county's namesake, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., which is more relevant today than ever. Dr. King once stated, yes, we are on the move and no wave of racism can stop us. We are on the move now. In county, in King, King, in King County, as part of our equity and social justice work, we are leading with racial equity and racial justice. Today, we must continue to focus on, support, and prioritize our black and brown communities. While we know that many in our region are thriving, structural racism, systemic barriers, and inequities continue to hold too many of us behind. This year's theme builds on the movement and momentum to continuously work to dismantle racism. At this time, I would like to recognize the elected officials who took, time, who took the time out of their busy schedules to join us by asking them to please stand. Please join me in thanking our elected officials with a round of applause. We also wanna thank all of you, our community members, our King County employees, who participate in many ways to advance equity and fight structural racism in our institutions and in our community. Thank you for being here. In the African tradition, we pour libation to pay homage to our ancestors. We will now ask Cecilia Hayes from the MLK Celebration Committee to please join us. Good morning, y'all. Say after me, I am because we are. I am because we are. I am because we are. 
I am Cecilia, daughter of Gladys Mary, granddaughter of Cecilia, great-granddaughter of Caroline and Anna, and mother of Julia Anna. I'm the Equity and Social Justice Manager for Department of Executive Services, and I'm here to pour libation. Please join me in a moment of meditation and gratitude. O oh, uplifted ancestors, guides, fierce protectors, and skilled healers, Please stand with us, your children, from many shores. Be with us in this moment and guide us along this road with cool heads and clear minds. We are root of your root, soil of your soil, bone of your bone, and blood of your blood. Not deaf to our sincere cries, nor blind to our honest, most fervent need. Keep the gifts of perfect health, wealth, and prosperity close to us so that we may honor and grow your legacy. We have not forgotten our commitment to our lineage, and we vow never to forget. Thank you, Ashe, and amen. This pour is for ancestors unknown and unnamed, whose grace and power have helped us travel safe thus far, and whose protective spirits have held us steady in every storm. May we all say, Ashe. Ashe. This poor is for ancestors whose stories we know and whose names are spoken with honor and reverence around our places of gathering and praise. May your actions of courage, hope, and resistance continue to offer deep lessons for our hearts and our minds. May we all say, Ashe. Ashe. And this poor is for my grandmother, Cecilia Anna Maria Collins, who knew everything I must know without knowing a page of it herself. I hope I make you proud. May we all say, Ashe. Ashe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. At this time, I invite the executive, council members, and all King County electeds to please come up as we present a lifetime award to council member Larry Gossett. During his, many years, during his many years of public service and community work, Councilmember Larry Gossett was the longest serving executive director of the Central Area Motivation Program, the oldest anti-poverty organization west of the Mississippi. And he went on to public office as a member of the King County Council. Councilmember Gossett is the sole surviving member of the Gang of Four, or the Four Amigos, with Bernie White Bear, Bob Santos, Roberto Maestas, working across racial lines and really modeling this work back in the late 60s and throughout the 70s. There really are too many accomplishments to list, to even begin to list, uh, for Councilmember Gossett. But one that is worthy of highlighting today is the fact that he was instrumental and a leader in making sure that King, Dr. Martin Luther King was our namesake and the image for our county. So thank you, Councilmember.
I'd like to thank King County uh, Executive Dow Constantine, all the members of the King County Council who are with us this afternoon, as well as the other uh, respected and honorable elected officials who are on the uh, stage with me, including our uh, sheriff and our elections uh, director. And I'd like to thank all of you because in accepting uh, this Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, I know and I want to tell you there's no way that I would uh, be able to uh, receive and accept uh, this fine acknowledgement of work that I have been able to do as an elected official in Seattle and in Martin Luther King Jr. County. If it were not for the tremendous support uh, that I and the various movements with which I've been associated uh, provided support, marvelous support, uh, sometimes surprising and very strong uh, support. Uh, I shared with the King County Council uh, earlier this week uh, the intersectional relationship that I have uh, with the unfortunate assassination of Dr. King. And I'd like to share it again uh, today because it's uh, representative of the tremendous uh, strides that we have made toward racial, economic, and social justice in this uh, community. Uh, but it's also representative of how far we still have to go. On uh, April 4th, uh, 1968, I and Aaron Dixon and Carl Miller were arrested between 8.30 and 9 a.m. in the morning and put in the King County Jail. We were not King Martin Luther King County back then. Uh, and I heard the uh, King County prosecutor, I'm telling y'all how far we've gone, uh, on TV, and at that time, uh, Charles Carroll said, we have to make an example of these outside agitators come in, coming in, and upsetting our Negroes. Well, I'm one of his Negroes because I was born in King County Hospital. I didn't come from anywhere. Uh, I'm a product of Seattle. Uh, so uh, they arrested us because five days before that, on March 29th, uh, there had been a, the first sit-in in Washington State uh, at the Franklin High School, the, the high school from which I graduated in 63. And in 68, uh, the principal had kicked two black student union leaders out of school that day for having combats or arguments with white kids, sent the white kids back to class. And the most outrageous thing that happened on March 29th uh, was that two black girls got kicked out of school for wearing their hair natural. And I'm looking out here and see plenty of beautiful natural hair, dude. But, thank you. Back on that day, though, the principal said, uh, I'm going to send a note home to your mothers. The note said uh, for uh, Nan Williamson and Joyce Triggers, uh, the note said, your daughter can no longer attend Franklin High School until she looks ladylike. He, he didn't realize how racist that was, that the beauty standards of our society was that you have straight hair. He didn't, I don't even think he knew that every other morning these young uh, black women had to spend about 20 minutes in the bathroom or in their bedrooms trying to straighten their hair with what we call a hot comb. <laughs> you dig what I'm saying? And it, it it was so beautiful that these girls said, I want to be my natural black and beautiful self, and came to school to represent that and got kicked out for it. Uh, and all the black students, most of the people in the black community were very upset. Uh, the girls were let back into school the next day. The boys were let back in. Franklin became the first high school to ever hire a black principal in the 105 year history of the Seattle Public Schools. In the 105 year history of 
uh, Seattle Public Schools, Franklin High School was the first high school that ended up hiring, hiring the first African-American history uh, teacher ever hired uh, by the Seattle Public Schools, all because these students took a stand, <laughs> reflected. <laughs> Re reflective of what they had been learning from Martin Luther King Jr. who was killed on the very day we were in jail. Uh, yeah, he was killed for organizing workers in Memphis, but that was just the most uh, recent example. But the main thing I believe he was killed because of, he was building a poor people's campaign that had black, Latino, Native Americans, uh, Asians, Pacific Islanders, uh, progressive whites, poor, poor whites all over our country coming together to march on Washington for the kinds of things that our Office of Civil Rights, our county executive, our county council, me when I was here for 25 years have been striving toward and that is making our county a better place for all people regardless of their past class racial backgrounds and that indeed still will continue to be through all of you who are county staff, uh, concerned citizens of, of the community. So it's within that context of struggle that I, uh, on behalf of all the people that have been in the movement here at King County government for 25 years, it's in that context that I accept this beautiful Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you. I will we'll add that this award that was created by our executive, Dow Constantine, uh, and now presented by uh, all electeds is going to be an ongoing uh, uh, yearly award uh, that will be presented in, in the name of Larry Gossett uh, into the future. So it gives us uh, great pleasure now to move and introduce our, our keynote speaker for today, uh, Professor John Powell. Uh, Professor John Powell is an internationally recognized expert in the areas of civil rights, civil liberties, structural racism, housing, poverty, and democracy. He is also the director of the Othering and Belonging Institute at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, your program and other places you can read a lot more. It's hard to capture Professor Powell's work in uh, one short paragraph or just an introduction. But what I wanted to say is that um, he is a thought leader. And more than that, I would even say that he's a spiritual leader for our uh, collective work to create a more racially just society. He's been central to developing better ways of thinking and operationalizing our work with such frameworks as targeted universalism and othering and belonging. But it's not just about ideas. Professor Powell makes it about people and relationships, and with whom and how you show up. 
We are in a time in history when we are faced with othering, exclusion, systemic racism, hate. Plus, we are seeing increasing racialized divides in wealth and in opportunity. As the antidote to all of this, Professor Powell responds with transformational change, centered in love and belonging. Please welcome Professor Powell. Thank you, thank you. I think um, I have a microphone on my ear, so I don't know if I need this one or not. But uh, first of all, it's just a delight to be here. I lived in Seattle twice. Um, my son was born here, and I left Seattle to go to um, Africa, uh, where my daughter was born, in Tanzania. So I say, no matter what, she really is an African-American. <laughs> um, and uh, I worked with uh, a number of you, including Larry Gossett. Uh, and so it was a time when he still had an afro, uh, <laughs> and I still had hair. Uh, uh, but it's been a delight being on this journey with many of you and with Larry. And the journey is hardly finished. Um, Dr. King left us something. He left us a vision, a way forward. And when he was here, obviously we didn't have iPhones, we didn't have the internet, but we did have racism. Um, and Malcolm X, who actually uh, was a co, um, in the same vineyard as Dr. King, the Reverend Dr. King, he said that racism is like a Cadillac. You get a new one every year. Uh, so it's not one thing. Uh, racism and the process of othering along racial lines is something that keeps changing and becomes more complicated. Please mention that we changed our name to the Othering and Belonging Institute. And we did that deliberately. I'm going to share a little bit of that history because I think it's relevant to our work and your work. And I do include our work as being related. Uh, we used to be the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. And we decided about a year ago to change our name to the Othering and Belonging Institute. And that was a long journey. When I went to Berkeley to start the Institute, um, there were several different clusters. There was the cluster focused on race. There was a cluster focused on LGBTQ. There was a cluster focused on disability, religion, poverty, immigration, uh, and so on. And each one of them was doing incredibly important work. Uh, but they didn't really see their relationship with each other except as distant friends. And what I thought about is that all of them, all of them were grappling with the issue of who belongs. Uh, and they were all being met by structures and societies, by stories, by cultures, and by individuals, either hostily or indifferently saying, you don't belong by people saying, essentially, you're invisible. Or if you're visible, you're only here assigned to a particular place. Um, there's a book out, some of you may know the book, called Strangers in Their Own Country. Uh, Strangers in, uh, and it's written by a colleague at Berkeley. And she writes about the dislocation of largely rural whites in America. And she talks about feeling strangers in their own country. And it's a, it's a real feeling, I'll talk about that more in a minute. But when I read the title, I thought, how did this become their country? There were people already here. We just saw some of them uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, and we skip over that part of our history. Um, when I was teaching at the University of Minnesota, I was talking about the taking of land from Native Americans. And some of my white students, um, mainly liberal in Minnesota, objected. And they said, Professor Powell, we didn't sign up for a class on Native American history. And I said, this is not Native American history. This is American history. This is about us. <laughs> um,
all of us. And so we have to own what we've done, own what we're doing, and collectively come together to move forward. So the reason we move from inclusion, and I gave a talk earlier this morning, that inclusion suggests you're joining something that's already there. So I give the example of, I'm giving a party, and most of y'all look pretty cool, uh, so I'm inviting you to my party. But it's my party. You come as a guest. It's my music, my friends, my food, and at the end of the night, as they say, you don't have to go home, but you got to go. <laughs> uh, that's what inclusion suggests. It suggests that you're joining someone else's thing, whereas belonging suggests that you're co-creating the thing you belong to. You're co-creating. So now, instead of it being my party, it's our party. And we develop the food. We develop the playlist. We decide who's going to be invited or not invited. And that's good. But it's also work. Because when you show up at someone else's party, all you have to do is show up. When it's our party, we have to design it. And so we move from inclusion to belonging. And when we talk about belonging, we say there's four things you need. You need agency. You need power. You need love. And you need responsibility. You need all four of those things. And King reminds us that power without love is ruthless. And love without power is sentimental. And so we want to bring those two things together. So why do you need responsibility? A lot of times when you talk about people being marginalized, or, or especially when you talk about race, and especially when you talk about anti-black racism, people get defensive. It's like, well, I wasn't here, and I'm not responsible, and why are you talking about that? Are you blaming me? And responsibility is that we are responsible together for the party in the world we create. We are all responsible. Not, not one of us created climate change. But our actions, our institutions, our structures, our economy is contributing to the changing of the earth. It's contributing to a billion animals being killed in Australia. We are all responsible. And that comes with a need to collectively move forward. So belonging is inviting all of us. And I do, by all, I mean all. I don't mean just people of color. I don't mean just Americans. I mean all of us. And again, some people will take exception to that. Uh, and sometimes we'll even disagree. And that disagreement could happen on different levels. Some of those disagreements we will think of as personal. I don't like so-and-so. So-and-so doesn't like me. And we talk about how do you actually deal with people who you think of as other. But we also remind people that there really is no other. King again reminded us that we're all connected. We're all connected. And the Reverend Dr. King did many things in his short lifetime. He died when he was 39. One of the most radical things he did was to nominate Thich Nhat Hanh for the Nobel Peace Prize. And a lot of people got upset. It's like, he ain't even black. <laughs> he doesn't even live in the United States. King was building a bridge. And he said, in order to fix the problems here in the United States, you have to actually connect to people all over the world. He was building a bridge. So one of the ways we actually build belonging is through building bridges. Now my friend Bell Hooks remind us, when you build a bridge, bridges are made to walk on. So when you connect to someone who looks a little different than you, who dress a little different than you, 
have a different name for God than you do, or maybe don't, they don't have a God at all. A lot of people will say, why are you connecting with those people? They're not even black. And the point of bridging is that we are already connected. And the challenge to bridging won't just come from, quote unquote, the other side. Sometimes it would come from your own group. They basically say, stay with your own group. Only care about your own group. So belonging is about saying everybody belongs. Everybody belongs. And so on. So when King was assassinated, he was reaching out across economic lines. Uh, and again, to co-create. What does co-create really mean? Now I know that there's some challenges here and there's challenges everywhere. Recently built a new facility for young people. And the question is, is that right or is that wrong? Should you do that or should you not do it? And those are serious questions to be put on the table. And I think it's important that you grapple with them. The answer, I don't know. I do know, I support the idea of zero detention for young people. I do know I care about black kids being locked up, Latino kids being locked up, Native kids being locked up, and even white kids being locked up. But I know that if you're black, the chance of you getting locked up goes up exponentially. If you're native, the chances of you being locked up and being exposed to suicide goes up exponentially. We have to care about that. We have to name those people, those communities who are left out. And we co-create. One of the things we have to make sure we do is the communities that are most impacted are at the table Not the cage. At the table with the power and resources to actually fully co-create. And let me just be clear. They're not co-creating for themselves. They're co-creating for all of us. They get to co-create not just for the community. When I lived here, Larry, it used to be the Central District. I don't know where it is now. but they get to co-create for the whole community, for the whole country, for the whole world. It's not your world, it's not my world, it's our world. And when I say our world, I don't mean we own the world, I mean we are part of the world, and the world is part of us. So how do we create a movement where we all get to show up? So I'm leaving here going to Europe because Europe's grappling with the same issues. And there's some people who believe that one group is better than another group, that one race is better than another race, that one religion is better than another religion. And we have to challenge that. Those of us who believe we are connected, those of us who believe that we show up deeply interconnected, the South Africans have a word, it's called Sabawanu. It's a Zulu word, and it means, I see you. And they go even further to interpret, the God in me sees the God in you. And as we heard in our introduction, I am because you are. We are deeply connected. Some people don't believe that. But even those people have to hold on to their humanity. Doesn't mean we agree with them. It doesn't mean we like them. But we have to acknowledge they were all deeply connected to each other and to the earth. That's what belonging is about. It's a radical concept. But it's the only way I think we as a people and we as a world continue to exist. As I said, going to Europe. Why Europe? Europe had a struggle. Within 60 years, they had three major wars. Bismarck from Germany, then World War I, then World War II. And they noticed something. 
Each war got more deadly. Each war killed more and more people. And the war was, what was it about? It was about a lot of things. It was about resources. But it was also about race. Many of you may, may not know that when Hitler was at the peak of his destructiveness, he said that there were four groups of white people in Europe, and only one were superior. So if you're an Italian, as far as Hitler was concerned, you weren't really white. You weren't fully human. And so his destructiveness almost destroyed all of Europe. And after the war settled, and we had been introduced to a new device called the atomic bomb, the Europeans said, and this is interesting because most of them didn't think of themselves as Europeans. And many of them didn't think of themselves as white. They were Germans, they were Italian, they were French, not European. But they said, if we do this again, we're in trouble. And Einstein said, I don't know what weapons we will use in World War III, but in World War IV, we will use sticks and stones because we'll be back in caves. So we can't do this anymore. So they created the European Union as a way of tying them together structurally, economically, politically. So it wasn't just an idea of saying, how do we show our interconnectedness, how do we belong? They, with, they did in terms of institutions, in terms of structures, in terms of schools, in terms of jobs. Not perfect, they're still struggling with it. But if King County is going to be a place for all, you have to think about it institutionally. You have to think about it in terms of your schools. You have to think about it in terms of your housing. You have to think about it in terms of transportation. You have to think about it in terms of your police. It's not enough to have a slogan that we're all connected, or we still segregate people in places where there's no opportunity. You know, um, I'm very fortunate. I'm six of nine, which doesn't mean I'm a bork. Uh, it means there are nine children. I'm a middle child. I'm doing my mother's and father's work, but I'm also doing the work of a middle child. My mom and dad were sharecroppers. Uh, and I sort of look at the projection of what's happened during their life. My grandfather was born in Mississippi. He used to always say, I'm glad to be from Mississippi. He died at 84 years old, deeply afraid of white people. When I went to college, I remember he said to me, as I was getting involved in a demonstration and helped start the Black Student Union at, at Stanford, he said, you better leave those white people alone. They don't play. He died being afraid of white people. When I watch my family and what they have gone through, I know we have made some progress, but I know it's not enough. In 1964, when I was going to go to college, I got a scholarship, a full scholarship, to go to Harvard. I turned to my family and I said, I'm not going. I have five sisters. My dad said, and my mom said, what? Boy, are you crazy? They didn't know about college, but they knew Harvard was somehow a place to go. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not going. I said, why aren't you going to go? I said, they don't allow women in. And the response is, what's that got to do with you? <laughs> I have five sisters. And still, we didn't connect the dots. And And my parents, who are deeply loving, my father just passed at 99, deeply loving Christian family, they said, if you don't go to Harvard, don't expect any help from us. Now, I don't know what kind of help they were had in mind, because they couldn't help me with my homework. <laughs> and they didn't have any money. Uh, so I said, OK, fine. <laughs> 
but they did help. They continue to help. Uh, but my point in saying that is that at 16 years old, I knew something was wrong with saying half, more than half the population are not allowed in this institution. More than half. I knew there was something wrong with that. Uh, but I didn't get any support. The language wasn't right. Now I can talk about it a little bit more eloquently. Um, so my point is, who's missing? Who's at the table and who's serving the table? How do you actually empower the groups that's most affected to really participate so that we all can belong? And I'll give you one example and then I'm going to close. So I'm working with a group in Richmond, California, mainly blacks and Latinos. And Berkeley, which is touted as the number one public university in the world, was trying to develop some land in Richmond. And they said the community should be involved, the black and Latino community. Now here's this august university that has more Nobel laureates at Berkeley than at Harvard and Yale combined. And you know what Berkeley did? They spent millions of dollars bringing experts to come and do a study on developing this land. And they developed these big reports. And then the California Endowment, which is the largest foundation in California, turned to me and said, John, we'd like you to help the community be involved. And they literally would give us 300-page reports and say, you got a week to respond. And, the, and this was involvement. This was community involvement. And I turned back to the California Endowment and I said, we need to hire a developer. We need to hire a soil engineer. We need to hire um, a bond council. And they said, but John, we hired you. I said, I'm good, but I'm not that good. And I'm smart enough to know what I don't know. And you can't bring the community with the table to the table with no resources. <laughs> so the endowment they did fund it reluctantly and say, we thought we'd have, you know, hired you. But my point is again, how do you make it so that we all can fully participate? And the most important exclusion. It's not exclusion in terms of money. It's not inclusion in terms of schools. It's exclusion in terms of setting the terms of the deal. It's inclusion in terms of defining. It's inclusion in terms of excluding in terms of deciding who decides. The first important thing is to say you fully belong. What do you need to actualize your belongingness? And your belongingness, again, is not simply a thing about what do your community need, that's true. That's part of it. It has to be part of it. We're not trying to disappear in these communities. But how do you belong and participate for your community and all communities? So we have a push in the world right now where some people are saying some people don't belong. And the liberal response to othering, which is what that's called, saying people are not fully human, People don't fully belong. They don't get the right to vote. They don't get a voice. They don't deserve resources. The response from the liberal community for, belong, for othering is called saming. Saming. You're just like me. And I know most of you are pretty cool out there, but I don't want to be you. The, the issue of responding to othering is belonging, where you get to fully show up who you are. And James Baldwin said it best. When he was at the height of his literary career, he was invited to join some august writing club that he was really interested in being part of. And as he was going to join, they said, Mr. Baldwin, you can really write. You're an amazing Negro. You know, he made a documentary called I'm Not Your Average, I'm Not Your Negro. <laughs> they say, you're an amazing Negro. I'm not, I'm not your Negro. But anyway, <laughs> they say, you can write. So you can join. But here's the deal. Don't remind us that you're gay. And don't show up with your black friends. 
And Baldwin left the country, went to France, and he wrote a book called The Price of the Ticket. And he said the price of belonging was too high. Uh, that the terms of belonging was too high. So one group should not set the terms. Um, so I'm encouraging, and I think Seattle plays a critical role in the country. You have resources. You have a lot of people of goodwill. You have problems, I know that. You have extreme inequality. Um, you have too many people sleeping in the streets. You know, I, should, I should talk, being from the Bay Area. Uh, but you have the resources to do this. But they have to be all of our resources. And I'll just end by saying, among all these committees about the future of work and what should we do with inequality and this tremendous wealth inequality. And I say to people, my position is all wealth, all wealth is commonwealth. Which means that we should decide, not someone at a big company that might live in Seattle by themselves. I mean, I'm just <laughs> hypothetically. <laughs> We should decide. That's what this radical idea of democracy is about. Uh, so again, it's been a delight to be here. Uh, I hope I can have a chance to work with you more in the future. I work with, uh, and I've worked with you in the past. And, and I hope that as you struggle with issues, whether it's uh, how do you deal with the, the detention center, or how do you deal with increased problems of inequality, that you do it with a kind of boldness, but a boldness that embrace both power and love and not dehumanize the person on the other side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Power, for the powerful message. As we wind down our program, I want to thank all of you, our community, our employees, elected officials, and Mr. Powell again, and our musician. At this time, I would like to ask our Celebration Planning Committee to stand so that we can acknowledge you. Commemorating our namesake for Martin Luther King County is necessary to remind us how far we have come, yet how much work we still need to do in order to become Dr. King's beloved community. Make this year's Martin Luther King Day a day of service, a day on, not a day off. And as we close, feel free to stand, clap, and especially join us in singing and a wonderful rendition of Ain't No Stopping Us Now. That's <laughs> that by Michael Hepburn. And as we live by Dr. King's words, yes, we are on the move, and no wave of racism can stop us. We are on the move now. Thank you.